Hey, uh, congratulations for making it here this morning. So some of you are actually here right now for BFGs. And <laughs> you actually found yourself in worship. You know, it'll be fun uh, hanging out out front about 12, 15. You watch, you know, some families whipping in the parking lot late for worship. <laughs> and they'll find out the parking lot is empty and everybody's already gone. What a tragedy. But this is a great group. Way, way, way to make it up this morning. I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. So a couple of things before I get started. One is um, every, every week I provide a message outline. Um, this morning, um, I really want you to use this. Uh, and it has to do with a homework assignment that I'm going to give you. So I want everybody to have a copy of this. If you don't have a bulletin, consequently you don't have one of these, would you raise your hand? I have two fine-looking young men right here that have uh, copies of the bulletin, and they'll uh, get one in your hand. So would you raise your hand, slip up, slip it down. Nobody will make you join anything or anything. <laughs> Nobody will embarrass you. Thank you very much for playing along. So make sure you keep it raised until you get a bulletin. So uh, that, and then you have your... Um, Bible open to Luke chapter 11. We'll be looking at uh, verses 1 through 4. Yes, I see that hand in the back. Yes, it's the very back. <laughs> um, thank you all for that. So uh, Luke chapter 11. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard the words conversation drag. Conversation drag. Let me give you a picture of what that looks like. So a uh, young guy um, kind of finds himself attracted to a, a young girl, and um, so he wants to ask her out on a date. He wants to move the relationship forward a little bit, but even as he asks her out, he notices this feeling of panic welling up inside of him, and, and that's because while it has been incredibly easy to talk to her in a group, he wonders what's going to happen when they get one-on-one. -on -one. When it's just him and the girl, will the conversation drag? Will they have enough to talk about? But this teenage boy is smart. He's proactive, and so he pulls from his pocket a scrap of paper, and on that scrap of paper, he jots down a number of themes, a number of topics that he can appeal to to make sure the conversation does not drag. And then he takes that piece of paper, folds it up, and puts it in his pocket. Thus avoiding conversation drag. Conversation drag. That's what happens often when it comes time to pray. Like I, I love uh, experiencing God in worship with this group. I mean, I, I feel his presence, and as I feel his presence, I notice welling up in me this desire to get close to him, to draw nearer. But I know that drawing close to him will require some one-on-one -on -one time, prayer. And, and I find in my soul this hesitant feeling, almost this panic. I wonder if it comes time for prayer, will I have enough to talk to him about? Or will there be conversation drag? And I wonder what would happen if, like that young man in the story, if I was proactive, and instead of just leaving it up to chance, what would happen if I kind of pulled out a scrap of paper, had a couple themes in mind that could guide my prayer time. I, I, I don't know if you can relate to that. Some of you, like, prayer is your thing. Like, prayer is no problem for you. But, but some of you can find yourself feeling like me. Uh, kind of steering away from prayer because you're afraid of conversation drag. It, it's like Jesus understands that feeling. And in Luke chapter 11... Verses 1 through 4, he addresses that topic. In those verses, I find him giving us a number of themes that we can use to guide our prayer time. If, if you're looking there, when the passage opens, Jesus has just finished praying. Now, the disciples are aware of that. 
In fact, the disciples see Jesus praying almost all the time. In, in the morning when they get up, Jesus has already slipped away and has spent time in prayer. Oftentimes when they went to bed, Jesus would slip off and spend the night praying. I mean, there are even occasions when Jesus would dismiss his disciples and remain behind so that he could pray. When he faced a critical juncture in his ministry, Jesus would often spend concentrated time in prayer. And it became apparent to the disciples that Jesus knew something about prayer to which they had not yet apprehended. And so on this day, when Jesus returns from praying, one of his disciples steps forward and speaks on behalf of the twelve. He says to Jesus, Jesus, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. And what follows, really, verse 2 through 13, is Jesus taking them to school on prayer. This morning, I just want to look at verses 2 through 4, where Jesus starts. In the week ahead, we'll be looking at the remaining verses. But he he begins by giving them what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, People look at this prayer at different lenses. Some people view this prayer through the lens of kind of this form prayer. Uh, Read it as something to be memorized and something to be recited, which is fine. It's been really helpful to a number of people uh, to do that. But other people, instead of viewing it as a form prayer, view it as more of a pattern prayer. And see and hear themes that are to govern our time of prayer. Themes that, if prayed, will lead to greater intimacy with God. Personally, for me, I find in here themes. These themes, to be honest with you, have, have really helped me in prayer. These themes have kind of guided me into greater intimacy with God in prayer. In fact, when I think of this verse, this is what I think of. Themes to repeat when I'm before the mercy seat. When it comes time to pray, I find in these verses six themes that I can pray. These six themes really break down into three general categories. And I use these to govern my time of prayer. So, if, if you're feeling like, I need to improve my prayer life, this morning, I just want to walk us through this passage, and hopefully the Lord will use it to teach us how to pray. So when it comes to spending time in prayer, to avoid conversation drag, begin your time of prayer by enjoying the love of God. Isn't that a great place to begin? Enjoying the love of God. Really what I mean by praying, Father, that you are the father of this believer. You are the father of this believer. I find that in the word father. And the idea is you contemplate the word father and let that lead you into this unfathomable ocean of the love of God. So even saying that, so if I'm you and I sit down and I'm supposed to begin enjoying the love of God in prayer by contemplating this word Father, I mean, even right there I begin to get lost. I mean, I feel like I'm standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. I'm supposed to take in the beauty, but it's just overwhelming and I don't even know where to start. So let me give you kind of a couple handles that you can do, use to begin using this term father to contemplate the great love of God. The first thing father says to me is that it's this unprecedented privilege. So when when I begin praying and enjoying the love of God and consider this idea that he invites me to call him father, I first think, I first celebrate that this is this unprecedented privilege. So when you survey the Old Testament, you'll find that God is called Father just 15 times. He's called the Father of Israel. He's called the Father of different individuals like Abraham. But get this. No one in the Old Testament ever called God Father. God was called their Father, but no one named Him as their Father. 
until you make your way into the New Testament. Then all bets are off. Jesus Christ called God his Father, not once, but over 165 times. It's unprecedented. No one in biblical history had ever done that. And then when you come to Luke chapter 11, Jesus is not only calling God his Father, but he invites us to call God our Father. It is this unprecedented privilege. It's also this undeserved privilege. When I think Father, I think undeserved privilege. So what I deserve because of my sin, is wrath. I deserve to be eternally separated from God. I don't deserve for Him to be my judge or my Father. I deserve for Him to be my judge. But Jesus died for sin. And when I believe that, when I receive Christ as my Savior, John chapter 1, verse 12, says that I move from being this rebellious creation of God to becoming this loved child of God. It is undeserved. And then when I think of Father, I also think unfathomable privilege. I mean, when, these, when this word tumbles from the lips of Jesus, it becomes clear that he has in mind everything that is good and warm about a father and nothing that is offensive. He, he, he thinks about the ability of a father. He thinks about the embrace of a father. To call God father is to think of the encouragement of a father or the tenderness of a father or the training of a father or the compassion and concern of a father. The embrace of a father. That's what Jesus had in mind when he uses this word father. And even as you begin to kind of find parallels, you find yourself lost. You find that it really is this undiscoverable, bottomless ocean. I mean, it is unfathomable. In, in fact, that, that point, Andrew Murray in a book he wrote called With Christ in the School of Prayer. On this whole idea of father, he says... It takes a lifetime to study it and an eternity to comprehend it. It's this beautiful word. One lady, Jane Merchant, put it poetically. To say to God, Father, is wondering gratitude. It's, it's ardent venturing awe. It's humble penitence. It's reverential praise. It's endless fellowship. It's all committing love to say Father truly is to pray. And Jesus says that's where you begin. You begin by addressing him as Father. Just one note on Luke's. It's really interesting what he does. So we're really familiar with Matthew's rendering of this passage. When Matthew starts it, he starts with, Our Father. Hey, and he does that because he wants us to know corporately that God is the Father of every believer. But when Luke begins it, he leaves the hour off and just begins Father. Because he wants to make the point that not only is God corporately the Father of every believer... God personally is the God of this believer. He is your Father. Begin by enjoying the great love of God and then move to considering the greatness of God. Uh, first, that would look like not only you are the Father of this believer, but you are worthy of global acclaim. Hallowed be your name. There was a little kid in a Sunday school class. The teacher asked, who in the class can say the Lord's Prayer? One little boy's hand went up. She said, sure, say the Lord's Prayer for us. And he said, our Father who art in heaven, how did you know my name? <laughs> yeah, and that fits really well with Father. Like, how do you know my name? 
But Jesus has a different idea in mind when he says, hallowed be thy name. The, the word name is this figure of speech where part, the name, stands for the whole of the reputation or renown of God. The passive verb, hallowed, is this desire on the part of the person praying that God's name would be honored and that globally. It's like Isaiah prayed, chapter 26, verse 8. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. Hallowed be thy name. I'm telling you, when I pray that, two things happen. When I say, Lord, you are worthy of global acclaim, the, the first thing that happens is this introspection. He, he is worthy and I begin to ask myself, do I live in a way that reflects that worthiness? Like, do, do I carefully go about my life so that everything's seen, whether, whether seen on earth or in the heavenlies, all those realities would look at my life and be moved to worship. It, it also provokes this more general desire that, God's renown would be known and that globally. That globally people would hear the gospel and bow the knee to the Lord Jesus. Now, I know that that's not reality. Like a lot of believers think that since the Great Commission was given 2,000 years ago, then surely the world has heard. Surely everyone in the world has access to the gospel. But it is not true. There are 16,600 different people groups on this globe. 16,600. Of those 16,600 different people groups in the world, 6,700 of them have no access to the gospel. 40% of the people groups in our world have no indigenous believing Christians who can carry the gospel to their people group. And what blows my mind even more is 42% of the world's population live in those 6,700 people groups. That's 1.45 billion people. Even if they wanted to hear the name of Jesus, could not. Because there's no one in their language or culture who can tell them about it. And so my heart cries out, hallowed be thy name. Lord, you are worthy of global acclaim. It's to consider the greatness of God. He's worthy of global acclaim. To consider the greatness of God is also to pray you are coming in glorious power. Thy, your kingdom come. When, when someone prays, your kingdom come, what they're thinking of is the end. So all human history will conclude with this seven years of horrific tribulation, the culmination of which will be the glorious coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes, all evil will be banished. He will set up his kingdom here on the earth righteousness will rule the day the world will be characterized by justice and peace and safety and then after a thousand years uh the uh then heaven or the heavenly state the eternal state will show up and we will enjoy that for all of eternity to pray thy kingdom come is to say lord you are coming in glorious power it is to say in the words of john even so come Lord Jesus, it is to think about that long, glorious end. It really is to ask the question, God, am I allowing you to rule over my life right now? So Jesus says, when you begin praying, begin by enjoying the love of God and then move to considering the greatness of God. And notice what's happened. It's really different from the way I pray. Typically, when I pray, I start with me. Lord, here, here's what I need you to do for me. And Jesus says prayer needs to start at a completely different place. It doesn't start with me. It starts with him. 
And it must be so. For prayer to be meaningful, it must be so. Because if it doesn't start with him, then prayer makes no sense. Jesus says, after you spend time enjoying the love of God and considering the greatness of God, it's then that you begin to confess your need for God. He starts with, give us this day our daily bread, which is to say, God, I need you to provide. Give us this day our daily bread. There's a cute story about a little girl. The mom came in the kitchen, and she had pulled a chair up to the wall, was standing in the chair. A little girl was standing in the chair, and she was looking at this picture on the wall. It's actually called Our Daily Bread. And when her mother drew close, she noticed that her little girl had tears in her eyes. And so she said, sweetheart, why are you crying? And she turned to her mother in great sincerity and said, Mom, he has no peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hear that and I'm reminded that oftentimes I get what I need and what I want confused. To pray, give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread are the things that we need. It's to think through the 24 hours ahead of you and look for the places that you really need God to show up. And it's to ask him to do just that, to meet your needs. You know, a lot of times I neglect that. And that's because, I mean, I, I think it all rests on me. I, I'm like Jimmy Stewart in this scene from the movie Shenandoah. Lord. We cleared this land, we plowed it, sowed it, and harvested. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. It wouldn't be here if we hadn't done it all ourselves, but we thank you anyway. Yeah, you know, that's how I go through life. And I neglect the fact that nothing is possible apart from him. I mean, frankly, um, I need air to breathe. I need a heart to beat. And I can't do that. If I'm a farmer, I need rain and I need sun. And I can't provide that. I mean, that's just a drop of all the things we need God to do and unless God shows up we have no clothes to wear we have no food to eat we have no shelter to live in no water to drink I mean I need people to love and people who love me I need hope I need I need strength I need wisdom to raise my kids and apart from the help of God, none of that is going to happen. And so we look at our day and pray, give us this day our daily bread. God, I need you to provide. Jesus says confessing our need is also praying, God, I need you to restore. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. I mean, that's a prayer that Jesus can't pray. Because he's the perfect son of God. It really, in this context, is not a prayer that unbelievers pray. What unbelievers need is the cross. It's at the cross when somebody receives Christ as Savior that they are freely forgiven through the justification that comes through Jesus Christ. This, forgive us our sins, is a prayer that believers pray. Which means that the image is not the judgment seat. It's not the judgment room. Because we're believers in Christ, heaven and hell are not at issue. I mean, our eternal state is set. The, the image is not the judgment seat. The, the image is a living room. And we sit before a father. And because we have faltered, the, the relationship has been messed with. And, and to say, forgive us our sins, is to say, uh, Lord Jesus, what I did was wrong. Forgive me so that I can enjoy once again the intimacy that we shared.
before. It's a prayer that God would restore. To pray that God would provide and then confessing my need for Christ is to pray, God, I need you to empower. Jesus says, and lead us not into temptation. Some people read that to mean uh, cause us not to succumb to temptation. Uh, as if God is the one who tempts. In James chapter 1, verse 13 says, God tempts no one with evil. And the better way, way to read that is not uh, cause us not to succumb to temptation, but do not um, cause us to cause us not. Sorry, I got this reversed. Do not cause us to succumb to temptation is the wrong way. Cause us not to succumb to temptation is the right way. It's this crying out to God. God, I know today that sin is going to come. Temptation will be here. Lord, empower me so I can walk in a manner worthy of the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, a good example of what this looks like is found just in the phrase before, where he says, for we forgive everyone who sins against us. It, it almost sounds like Jesus is saying God's forgiveness of us is conditioned on whether we forgive other people. But that's to read the line in the wrong light. It doesn't refer to God's forgiveness, but the reference is asking. And what Jesus is saying is God forgives. We ask, God forgives. But if we fail to forgive other people, then that cuts us off from the ability to really experience that forgiveness. A lot of times I'll sit with people in my office who are struggling with receiving the forgiveness that God has for them. They just don't feel forgiven. And as I probe, the problem is that they're not forgiving someone else. And while God has forgiven them, this unforgiveness keeps them from actually experiencing the forgiveness that God has for them. But forgiving other people is hard. And so we cry out, God, empower me. Give me the ability to forgive so that I can experience your great forgiveness. When, when I read through these verses, as I mentioned earlier, I find themes to repeat when I'm for the, before the mercy seat. When, when it comes time for me to pray, I have running around in my head these three broad categories and these six subcategories. I think of the theme, Father, begin by enjoying the love of God. You are the Father to this believer. And then I move to considering the greatness of God. You are worthy of global acclaim. You are coming in glorious power. And after I behold Him, then I move to this third category, of confessing uh, my need for God. Lord, I need you to provide. Here are the things that are coming up today. Lord, I need you to forgive. Here are the places I've faltered in this last day. And Lord, I need you to empower me so I can walk with you. Themes to repeat when I sit before the mercy seat. So I mentioned a bit ago that I wanted you to fill this deal in because I wanted to give you a homework assignment. How do you feel about homework assignment? For some of y'all, it's been a long time since you've had a homework assignment. Here's what I want you to consider doing. Over this next week, I want you to spend each of the next six days reading Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, six times. And spending at least six minutes praying through these six themes. There's a repetition of a word, six. Hopefully it's not three times. That would be awkward. <laughs> Good, it's four. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Is starting tomorrow morning, or starting someday tomorrow, sometime tomorrow, is you'll open your Bible to Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And sometime tomorrow, you'll read through the passage six times. You'll find that it'll take you about four minutes. Four minutes to read those four verses six times. And you'll find an interesting thing happens. 
as you read through those six times, you'll find your mind getting focused on the Lord and you'll find your heart ready to pray. So begin tomorrow, some point, reading Luke 11, 1 through 4, six times. And then after you spend four minutes reading it six times, then spend the next six minutes praying through the six themes that Jesus points to in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. You know, begin by enjoying the love of God by praying, Father, then move to hallowed be your name, then to your kingdom come, then to give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Lord, enable me i've been doing this for a couple days and for me it really has helped me move forward in my prayer time i like the guy i talked about at the very beginning (laughs) yeah i just want to know the lord better and this gives me themes to pray so the conversation doesn't drag i read an interesting thing about the president of the united states this week the President of the United States, this may surprise you, um, gets around 10,000 letters, packages, or emails every day. 10,000. And so the government <laughs> has a department called the Department of Presidential Correspondence. So when you send, if you do a letter or a package or email to the President of the United States, first it's uh, reviewed by the Secret Service. If it's found to be safe and legitimate, then they pass it off to this department. This department is made up of 375 different people. 375 people process those 10,000 letters to the president. From that, they narrow it down to about 300. 300 of those go to the head of the Department of Presidential Correspondence. This lady reads all 300, narrows it down to 10, and it's those 10 that daily go to the President of the United States. You know, the likelihood of you getting communication through to the President of the United States is not very probable. But here's the good news, is God doesn't have a department of divine correspondence. When you pray, Father, you are instantly in communion with Almighty God. Let's not waste that. Let's this week say with the disciples, Lord, teach me to pray. Would you pray with me?